the earliest parts of the Bible that were translated in English actually were in Anglo-Saxon, and these were the first people, the Angles and the Saxons came from, from Upper Germany into England, from the Low Countries, into England, and they were the first colonizers. They were the first non-native population. And missionaries came with them. So very early on, there are translations into Anglo-Saxon of the Bible, but never the whole Bible. And again, who's reading this? Anglo-Saxons were a oral culture. They had wonderful stories. Um, a few of you will recognize the word Beowulf. I hear there was a wonderful movie made from Beowulf. Um, but that, those were the Anglo-Saxons, and they were a rather warlike people. Um, there was great efforts to transform them, to convert them to Christianity. And in fact, different versions we have of Beowulf show early on a very, very um, non-Christian early text, and the later texts are, very, are more Christian, but there would be the dissemination within the church. And again, this is not a people's Bible. There might have been a little bit, but it's primarily for use of scholars and monks. The next effort to translate the Bible, and, and, and uh, Provost Tippins talked about this a little bit last time, is the Wycliffeite Bible. And this was the first complete English translation of the Bible. And I'm leaving this here because this is, again, a direct, just straight transliteration from Latin into English, all right? This was a very dangerous project. And actually, what was going on and how the Wycliffe Bible came about is Wycliffe himself, who was a fairly interesting man, and you wouldn't think of him, he's a radical, but he is an ordained priest. He's actually the dean, and the scholar, one of the scholars, and I believe he was at Oxford. He was a theological scholar. This is who he was interested in. Um, but he himself started going back to text, and of course, because he was a scholar, he had access to text. Um, you know, this is, it's not the common people. He was not a common man. But he started getting, one of the traditions in the universities, and there was Oxford and Cambridge, was to have disputations in the community. So Wycliffe actually raised topics for disputation with other members of the academic community. And his disputation, in preparing for his disputation, he went back in a rather unusual way to looking at scripture as his authority. Now, that doesn't sound unusual to us. All right, but in the Middle Ages, that's not actually how most theology worked. You looked at the work of other theologians and their commentaries. So when Wycliffe did this, he started finding dissonance. And what I mean by that is he's not finding things that exactly fit with his image of things. And he started personally reading a Bible. This gets, story gets told several times. Not just Wycliffe, but of course this was Luther. This was so many people were transformed by reading the Bible. Um, and he finally, as I see, was the canon of Lincoln Cathedral, and he had been at the universities. He actually came to his conclusion from his Bible reading that there was not authority for the Pope in Scripture. And this was a pretty radical position to take in the 14th century when, at this point, we don't even call it the Catholic Church. It is the Christian Church, the Western Christian Church. Is, uses Latin in the language and the Pope is the head of it. And Wycliffe got into big debates about papal authority. Um, probably not surprisingly, this got him into a lot of trouble and he actually was finally prosecuted. And my first wonderful illustration of censorship, um, everybody tried to get a hold of any examples of the Wycliffe, Wycliffe I, and he, didn't, he did some of the translation. It was all compiled, he did bits and pieces here, bits and pieces here, and then his followers put it together and actually put it together as a single translation. Mm -hmm.